in this series, uh, DNA, in this collection of talks, what we're doing is we're, we're looking at Parkwood's DNA. Uh, not any one individual, not a pastor, like our collective body, our church's DNA. They're the, the building blocks of who we are, the, the values that God birthed deep into our hearts long ago that drive us. So in week one, just in uh, way of recap, in week one, we talked about how the resurrected Jesus alone is the hope of humanity. Uh, we spent an, en- an entire week just focusing on this thought that, that if Jesus lives, then peace lives and love lives and joy lives and hope lives if Jesus lives. And so that, that, that idea that Jesus is our hope, it's not just this vertical thing between us and God, it's horizontal in application, right? It drives us uh, to love our neighbors and to reach the lost. And so that was week one. Week two, last week, uh, we spent a, a whole week on uh, the church being our home, right? Uh, that the church is not just an organization or an institution. It's not just a building that we come to once a week and hear some teaching. No, 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 no. It is our home. Why? Because the church is family and we are first family, and really, last week, if you weren't here, uh, we, we spent some considerable time in the service just highlighting that this family that we're a part of, this, this church home, is a very diverse, multicultural family. I mean, we had flags from side to side, and we were just coming together uh, to lift high the name of Jesus, that what unites us is not the color of our skin. What unites us is the person of Jesus Christ. And so we gather as one family under his name and his name alone. So again, week one, Jesus is our hope. Week two, the church is our home. And now week three, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Faith is our lifestyle. This is the piece that I want us to focus on today. Uh, Why don't you turn to your neighbor and just tell him this morning, faith is our lifestyle. Come on, just tell him. Faith, 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 faith. We're going to talk about faith this morning. Faith is not a switch that we flip when it suits us best. Faith is not a panic button that we push in times of trouble. Faith is not a free ticket to utopia. Faith is a lifestyle. Faith is a chosen way of living. Faith is quite literally how we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. It's it's a lifestyle. It's all day, every day. We are called to live in faith. So I want to show this to you. If you've got a Bible, open them up. Let's go to Matthew chapter 14. Uh, in Matthew chapter 14, I, I, I want to take us to a very popular story. My guess is, for those of you that might even be new to Christianity, or you might not even be a Christian, but you're listening online, or you're in the room, chances are you've probably heard this story before, uh, but I'm praying that this morning that we would see it in a whole new light. So Matthew chapter 14, let me, let me set this up as you're turning there. Right before what we're about to study, right before this, a mass crowd of people has come to see Jesus. They want to hear his teachings on the kingdom. Probably many came because they're they're seeking a miracle, a healing in their life. And the Bible will tell us that there was 5,000 of them. Uh, Now, most scholars agree that that only was a count of the men. If you include the women and the children, this group could have been upwards to 10,000 people. And they meet in this kind of desolate region, and eventually the the, the people get hungry. So the disciples come to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, why don't you dismiss the crowds into the neighboring towns so they can go get food? And so Jesus says, why? We have everything that we need right here, which makes no sense. But then what he does is he takes five loaves of bread and two fish. He prays over it. And it miraculously multiplies over and over and over and over and over again, so much so that they feed all 10,000 people and there's leftovers. Like just an amazing move of God. And what we're about to read is what happens next. So here we go, verse 22 of chapter 14. 
says this, immediately after this, that's immediately after this, this miracle, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat to cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. So be, Jesus basically tells his disciples, all right, huddle up, boys. Here's the game plan, okay? Uh, I am going to send the people home. I'll say the goodbyes. I'll dismiss the crowds. And, and when I do that, I want you to go head across the Sea of Galilee by yourselves. I'll stay here. You go there. Now, now just a side note, Parkwood, what I absolutely love about Jesus, what I love about Jesus is, is, is that he's always taking us somewhere, isn't he? Like, like if, if, seriously, if you're truly following in the footsteps of Jesus, you ever, you ever notice that like life's just not stagnant, right? He's, he's moving us, <laughs> just like he moved the disciples. He's moving us towards our purpose. He's moving us towards uh, his plans for our life. He's moving us uh, really where he wants to direct us. This is life with Jesus. So he says to the disciples, you go there, I'll stay here. And while Jesus was praying to the Father, this is where we pick up the rest of the story, verse 24. It says, Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, It's a ghost. All right. Geographically, let me help you understand what's happening here. Uh, it's important, and I say this often, when we come to the scriptures that we realize uh, this isn't like a Star Wars film, okay? It didn't happen in a galaxy far, far away. These are real places that actually exist. The Sea of Galilee is a very real body of water. I've been there. I've been on a boat across the Sea of Galilee. And if any of you have ever been there before, what you'll know is that it's really not that big of a body of water, uh, but it's surrounded by all of these high hills. And so what happens is these storms come rolling off the hills, they hit the lake, and they have nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. And so oftentimes it's colliding winds, and it kind of picks up in a circular fashion very strong. The disciples find themselves in one of these windstorms. And they're fighting the wind and the waves for hours and making really not a lot of headway. And then somewhere around three o'clock in the morning, Jesus shows up. But what's interesting is that he doesn't show up on a boat. Uh, he doesn't roll up on a jet ski. Um, he, he just appears to them in the middle of a storm, in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, walking on water. And so the disciples are terrified. Why? Because no human beings can possibly do what he's doing. They think he's a ghost. Why? Because no human beings can possibly do what he's doing. You, you, you get the picture? People don't walk on water. Someone should just write that down. That's like worth the price of admission. Right there. It's it's impossible. I don't know if you know this. I don't know if you've ever tried it before. It doesn't work. You go through the water. And yet, the disciples are in the middle of the sea, in the middle of a storm, and there's somebody walking their way. It's absolutely terrifying. And if you were there, you would be terrified too. We'll just pick it up. Watch verse 27. It says, but Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called him, Lord, <clears throat> love this, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. <laughs> you ever just pause and stop to think about what a weird thing that was for Peter to ask? Like, Lord, if it's you, tell me to walk out in the storm. Like, if it was me, if it, honestly, if it was me, I would say, Lord, if it's you, can you please stop the storm? Lord, if it's you, can you please calm down the wind and the waves? Because that's how we pray, isn't it? 
Lord, if it's you, can you please fix my situation? But Peter doesn't say that. He doesn't say, Lord, can you please fix my situation? He says, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come to you. He asked Jesus for a command. He asked Jesus for purpose. He asked Jesus for some direction. And the only way, the only way that Peter is actually going to figure out if this is God or a ghost is by stepping out of the boat and following his rabbi on the water. Now notice, Jesus says, come. (laughs) He doesn't say, all right. I'm going to give you, Peter, I'm going to coach you through this. Step one, take off your sandals. Step two, place your feet gently on the ground. Step three, don't look down. Like, he doesn't do that. Why? Because following Jesus, life with Jesus, is not like assembling Ikea furniture. Somebody with me? You know where I'm going? Like, sometimes when we get in this relationship with God, we, we, we think that there's going to be this manual or these blueprints that are just going to explain everything. But How many people know? That's not how it works. Oftentimes, if if God did give us a manual to every single decision, there is absolutely no need for faith. God doesn't always give us the full blueprints, but he will always give us enough of what we need to make that first step. And for Peter, it was one word. Come. Come. And I love this. We'll pick it up in 29 again. It says, so Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? Hmm. Now, this is usually the point in the sermon where Peter, our, our preachers just beat Peter like a pinata. Any, anyone ever heard a sermon that right about now, it's all of a sudden the preachers say, Peter, man, little faith. Peter couldn't do it. Peter doubted, right? And it's like, yeah, like, There's some truth in there, but to be honest this morning, uh, I'm not going to go down that road. I'm not going to go down that road. How about instead of us looking at Peter and and questioning Peter, why don't we we ask the question this morning, where are the other 11? You ever think about that? Where are the other 11? Men, please notice, Jesus says to Peter, oh, you a little faith. Yes, he doesn't say that to the other 11 because the other 11, it was actually, oh, you of no faith. Because you opted for a risk-free life. Hmm. Oh, I wonder, there's some people in the room or online right now, man, if that's what you've opted for as well, a risk-free free, no faith, sitting in the boat, never walking on water, life. (laughs) And you know what's really interesting? It's really easy to criticize from inside the boat, isn't it? It's really easy to complain or blast people from a place of safety. I just kind of recognize this, right? Like, it's, it's easy to sit back risking nothing and just start hurling your comments at other people that are actually trying. Say, like, Peter, man, that was embarrassing. You sunk like a rock, man. <laughs> I told you so. Like, like, it's easy to criticize It's very easy to criticize from inside the boat. But listen, I don't know about you, Parkwood, but I would rather be the guy that walked on water even for a moment than to be sitting in the boat and to have never experienced it at all. Listen, what I'm about to say right now is very simple and very profound. You ready? Here it is. If you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. 
I'm just going to let that sit, okay? If you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. If you want to experience the things of God, you actually have to follow him. If you want to know his will, you must risk. If you want to be used, you must move. If you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. But let's just be honest. Let's just be real, okay? It's scary, Why did one get out of the boat and 11 stay in? Because it's scary to step out on water. It takes faith to walk on water. (laughs) Man, uh, I'll I'll be honest. A few months ago, so in less than an hour, what time is it? About an hour from now, we're going to be voting on the purchase of this property in the downtown of Windsor. A number of months ago, when this opportunity first came our way, I'll I'll be honest, like there was a part of me that was immediately excited about this and the opportunities that we would have as a church and how we would be able to go. But but there was another part of me, um, just full disclosure, that was scared. (laughs) Because, yes, although we would be going back to where it all began for us 100 years ago in the downtown, but... I don't know if you've noticed, the downtown is very different than it was in 1923. And let, let's not go 1923. We left the downtown in 1989. It's very different than it was in 1989. Like, it, 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 it's, it's a whole different place now. The needs are different. They're, they're great. I mean, uh, the, the, the drug addiction, the homelessness, the, the violence, the... Uh, Honestly, the specific area that we are looking to purchase this property in is this highly uh, densely populated uh, Muslim area. Now listen, I've, I've, I've had Muslim friends most of my life and reach out and that, but it's, it's a difficult group to break into. There, there's so much sacrifice for those uh, Muslims that want to decide to follow Jesus. And, and there was this part of me that, that was just, scared. I, I, I remember a few months ago when, when, I, when I was trying to wrap my head around this, it was basically like I was saying to God, Lord, if you want us to walk on water, um, God, may, maybe, maybe there's somewhere else that we can practice on first. God, God if, 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 you, if you want us to walk on water, maybe there's somewhere else where just the sea's a little bit calmer. Maybe there's a pond out there that's stagnant. Why don't we why don't we try there first? And, and then I started to try to educate God. Anybody here ever try to educate God? I tried to tell him, you know, Lord, it's choppy water in the downtown. The wind's blowing in the downtown. I don't know if you've noticed, Lord. And, you know, it was kind of through this uh, repeatedly. I just felt the call of God speaking to my heart and saying, Danny, would you just come to me? and I'll show you what I can do. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, the the wind blows and the waves are high. But Parkwood, I I think one of the things that God has just done repeatedly is just reminding me of who he is. Now listen, I I, want to be clear here, just so we're, we're all aware, if we purchase this building in the downtown and we do ministry down there, we need to understand we're not bringing Jesus into the downtown. You got me? So some of you are kind of confused. It's not like Jesus exists in this building with us and he's not down there right now. A more accurate picture, go back to this story with, with Peter and Jesus walking on water. Man, Jesus is in the storm. <laughs> and what he's doing is he's inviting us. Hey, would you step out? And would you come to where I already am? Listen, I'm not naive. I don't for one moment think that if we do this, it's going to be easy and it's going to be clear sailing. It's not. It's, it's going to be difficult. We've got a lot of decisions to make. It, 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 it's going to take a, a lot of head knowledge and prayer and it's going to take a whole lot of stuff. It, it's going to take faith to walk on water. You, you know what it's going to take? It's going to take eyes fixed on Jesus for the long haul. Okay. Back to the story. This is very important this morning. When Jesus said to Peter, 
Oh, you of little faith. We have to be clear. Jesus is not questioning the quality or the quantity of Peter's faith. He's challenging the duration. Peter, see, a a misunderstanding of this story would be to say, Peter had little faith. He didn't. Okay, the the understanding here is not that like his faith was weak, it was that he didn't keep it. He he, he ran out. For for Peter in the story, faith was a momentary thing. He had faith, huge faith. He walked on water. Anybody here ever done that? Yeah, Peter had great faith. The problem wasn't the quality or the quantity, the problem was the duration. You see, as long as his eyes were fixed on Jesus, everything was fine. As long as he was following the commands of Jesus, everything was fine. It was only in the moment that he took his eyes off of Jesus and onto his problems. It was only then that he began to sink. Faith. It's a lifestyle. Are you seeing the picture here? Faith is not this momentary thing. It's not a switch that we flip. It's not a panic button that we push. It's a day-by-day decision to walk in step with our creator God, keeping our eyes fixed on him. All the way. I mean, seriously, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Hebrews chapter 11. If you don't know, it's, it's called like the great faith chapter. And what it does is it just lays out all the men and women who, who exercise their faith in the Old Testament. And then Hebrews 12, the very next verse, as we go into the next chapter, just says, therefore, since we've been surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run the race with perseverance, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. Okay? Like, this is what we do, church. We are called to be people of faith. We, we have a rich history, 100 years, of men and women saying yes to the call of God, following him every single step of the way, even though it made no sense, even though they didn't have the blueprints of how it was all going to work out. But we have a history of men and women that when Jesus said, come, We said, okay. Faith. Faith is a lifestyle. Worship team, why don't you come on back up? I want to close with this story. We're having a shortened service today because we have to get into this business meeting. But Charles Blondin, uh, I actually told this story a number of years ago. And uh, this week it was just kind of sitting kind of heavy on my heart again and Charles Blond was a, uh, a a tightrope walker is there another name for that no he walked on ropes <laughs> it's what he did for a living and uh, at one at one point what he did is he went to Niagara Falls and they they strung this long cable across Niagara Falls and he And he brought in this crowd and he asked him a question. He said, who here thinks that I can walk across this rope from one side to the other? And the people said, oh, we believe, we believe. And said, awesome. He pulled out a wheelbarrow. And he said, who here thinks that I can push this wheelbarrow on the rope from one side to the other? And the people said, oh, we believe, we believe. And then he said, who here thinks that I could put somebody in the wheelbarrow and go from one side to the other? And the people with excitement said, oh, we believe, we believe. But then he asked the question, he said, all right, who's getting in? <laughs> and seriously, it's like, nobody. Nothing. It was silence. And I hear this story this very famous story, and I just wonder if it doesn't have something to teach us about the church. I mean, how many times have we read in our Bibles about a God who does miraculous things? We read about a God who parts the Red Sea, and our response is, we believe, we believe. We read about a God who shuts the mouths of lions, and we say, we believe, we believe. 
We read about a God who died on the cross for the sins of humanity and resurrected on the third day. And with excitement in our hearts, we say, we believe, we believe. But then there's the moment when Jesus turns to us and he says, all right, now your turn. Who's getting in the wheelbarrow? Who's going to step out of the boat? And trust me that I've got you in this. You see, Parkwood, this message is so much bigger than, um, it's so much bigger than the, the, the purchase of a property in the downtown. It's, th- this is about your life right now. This message is about your marriage. It's about your kids. It's about your neighborhood. It's about your workplace. It's about your neighbors. It's it's literally about every part of your life. When Jesus comes knocking and he says, all right, it's your turn. How are you going to respond? Are you going to step out in faith? Are we going to sit back in the boat where it's nice and safe? What I believe is that Jesus is calling us as his followers to be a people of faith. Not just momentary faith, but a people who live by faith and not by sight. Can we stand on up to our feet? Before we close, I just want to, I want to read a Franciscan blessing over you. As we live in this world, in this city, in this area, I want to, I want to read this blessing over your life in light of this message that we just heard. It goes like this. May God bless you with a restless discomfort about easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may seek truth boldly and love deep within your heart. May God bless you with holy anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people, so that you may tirelessly work for justice, freedom, and peace among all people. May God bless you with a gift of tears to shed with those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, or the loss of all that they cherish, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and transform their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you really can make a difference in this world so that you are able, with God's grace, to do what others claim cannot do be done. Parkwood, may you live by faith and not by sight. May you get your eyes off of the things of this world and back onto Jesus. Jesus.